covers a particular subgenre of speculative fiction that scratches an itch for me like no other. It's where you find yourself in a world very much like our own, except one thing is slightly off. Perhaps there's a movie theater that plays only memories, or the story centers on a child who learns the language of cats. Or in this familiar yet unfamiliar world, everyone wears electronic bracelets that monitor their moods. These stories place the fantastic alongside the mundane, yet their speculative elements feel subtle compared to other works classified as fantasy or science fiction. The Midnight Library by Matt Haig, for example, has a contemporary setting that features one distinct speculative element, the Midnight Library, which is a manifestation of purgatory that allows the main character to travel along alternate life paths by choosing different books from the shelves. It's a fantasy novel, certainly, but to group it with the fantasy worlds of Patrick Rothfuss or Robin Hobb feels akin to calling cereal a soup, the related but distinct categories. When I think of this brand of speculative fiction, the real world but one notch off, dozens of examples spill into my mind, many of them crossing other genres. I think of Every Day by David Levithan, a young adult romance that sends its protagonist into a new body day after day. In V.E. Schwab's historical novel, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, a woman gains immortality, yet is cursed to be forgotten by others. A man inexplicably transforms into a giant insect in Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis, combining horror and philosophy. In the world of television, there's Pushing Daisies, a whimsical show wherein a pie maker can resurrect the dead with one touch, but a second touch returns them to the grave forever. What all these stories have in common is that they explore human relationships and daily life through the lens of an often singular or anomalous speculative element. Although terms like magical realism, fabulism, low fantasy, soft sci-fi, and light speculative fiction already exist, I don't think any of these adequately encompass the narratives I'm talking about, the type of fiction I want to devour as a reader and replicate as a writer. That's why I suggest a new subgenre label, curio fiction. I first proposed the term in an article for Tor entitled, What is Curio Fiction? Finding a name for a fantastical subgenre. Subgenres communicate to readers what type of story elements they should expect. In high fantasy, readers expect detailed world building and an immersive realm. There, you'll find authors like Brandon Sanderson and Tamora Pierce. In urban fantasy, there are often magical creatures and paranormal mysteries in city settings, as in the stories of Patricia Briggs and Jim Butcher. Curio fiction serves its own purpose as a subgenre in loosening the constraints that some writers might feel around writing fantasy or sci-fi, genres that tend to suggest in-depth world building. Curio fiction shifts the emphasis from world building to everyday human relationships. Here, I'm going to first define the key features of curio fiction, followed by a bunch of examples, as is my want. Then I'll touch on how it differs from other fantastical subgenres. At the end, I'll have a guided writing exercise where you'll come up with a curio fiction concept of your own. Curio fiction fits snugly under the broad umbrella of speculative fiction. Speculative fiction is a kind of nebulous term for stories that cross the fantasy, sci-fi, or horror boundaries in some way. Curio fiction, in particular, is a story set in a world identical or similar to our own, whether that setting is contemporary, historical, or near future, with an added fantasy, science fiction, or horror element that is examined for its effect on the story's human characters. Not all stories will fit into genre or subgenre boxes, and there are always overlapping categories. I wanted to choose a label where the meaning is immediately understood and felt, or at least implied, much as it is with the subgenres of grimdark, noble bright, and steampunk. The term curio fiction calls to mind curio cabinets filled with strange delights, and curiosity shops where you never know what you'll find. Merriam-Webster defines curio as something considered novel, rare, or bizarre, and also an unusual or bizarre person. To me, this perfectly suits the nature of these stories with an unusual component that exists in an otherwise normal world. In his seminal work on the history of the sci-fi genre, Metamorphoses of Science Fiction, Darko Suvin proposes the term novum to describe scientifically plausible innovations in science fiction narratives. The novum the new thing, or novelty, is the element in the story that deviates from the reader's normal expectations of reality. 
I'll use Curio in a similar fashion to refer to the speculative element that twists a story set in a realistic world into a piece of Curio fiction. Here are what I would consider the five defining features of the Curio fiction subgenre. Number one, it takes place in a real world setting. It need not be a specific name place in our world, nor does it need to be contemporary. It can be historical or near future. Francis Harding's The Lie Tree is set in the Victorian era on a fictional island with a mysterious tree as its curio. When someone tells the tree lies, it delivers hidden truths. Unlike surrealist or absurdist fiction, curio fiction more closely mirrors the logic and the human experience of a realistic world. Number two, it explores a story-defining speculative element, a curio, that's one notch off from reality. This could entail a strange place, a person with an unusual power, or a mysterious item. If the curio is a technology, it might be integrated into society and perceived as normal. With a magical curio, the characters typically perceive it as unusual. By contrast, strange happenings are often treated as par for the course in magical realism and fabulism. If I Stay by Gail Foreman has the hospitalized protagonist stuck between the world of the living and the dead, forced to choose if she wants to wake up from her coma or move on to the afterlife. The curio is that out-of-body experience as the protagonist watches her otherwise ordinary life from afar. Number three, the magic isn't usually defined as part of a global system, or the speculative element relies on a hand wavium scientific explanation. The curio is a means for exploring themes or creating conflict, but the author might not explain why it exists or the larger system it operates under, i.e. it's unclear whether the oddity exists elsewhere in the world or how it came to be. The world building is smaller in scale and more localized to one character or area, unlike the larger realms of the Marvel Cinematic Universe or Harry Potter. In Rebecca Searle's In Five Years, the protagonist spends an hour in her own future five years ahead. When she returns to the present, her experience in the future has changed her perceptions of her present-day life, but the reader never discovers how she went forward in time. Magic and immersive fantasy typically has rules and a structure, but in curio fiction, the speculative element oftentimes stands out from the rest of the world's rules for no readily apparent reason. Number four, humans are the primary focus. Curio fiction centers more on human capabilities than different magical or extraterrestrial species. By contrast, other fantasy subgenres might involve fantastical creatures like dragons or elves, and certain sci-fi subgenres feature various types of aliens or robots. This is also what differentiates curio fiction from most urban fantasy, which often has vampires, werewolves, or the fey folk. The Cartographers by Pung Shepard is an example of a human-centered approach to the speculative with the curio being a dash of magical map-making. Number five, the story is less concerned about the mechanics of the curio and more interested in its effects on relationships and social systems. Curio fiction is less complex than other speculative genres in terms of world-building, but not in terms of characterization, themes, prose, or plot structure. The what-if question the curio poses often serves as a thought experiment related to time, memory, love, death, free will, or life-changing choices. Because of that philosophical angle, curio fiction is sometimes more conversation-based than action-based, as in The Man from Earth and The Booth at the End. Romance is a common focus in the subgenre, like the movie Timer, where a device counts down the minutes until the user meets their soulmate. Curio stories can involve plots that are more limited in scope, although not always. Stephen King's The Dead Zone stars a clairvoyant who discovers a nefarious political plot, pushing the novel into the thriller domain with high stakes. In general, though, curio fiction features highly personal stakes, where one person's relationships and sense of self hang in the balance. Human desires take center stage, and the curio often intensifies the desires, fears, and struggles the characters already possess, and would still have in the absence of the curio. The curio simply influences how they confront those challenges. So those are the five defining features of curio fiction in my mind that make it a specific subgenre. A number of familiar tropes fit into the curio fiction mold, and I have 10 tropes that come to mind. 
The first is time loops, wherein a character, or sometimes multiple characters, are forced to relive the same day over and over again, the most famous example being the movie Groundhog Day. As IMDb describes it, a narcissistic, self-centered weatherman finds himself in a time loop on Groundhog Day, and the day keeps repeating until he gets it right. In these stories, the character often needs to become a better person in order to escape the time loop. There's a positive character arc. Time loops are also a commentary on the impact of our choices. They show how small changes in our attitudes or behaviors can make a significant difference in our lives. Related to time loops is small-scale time travel, where it happens on an individual level rather than an entire system or technology built around it. The time travel is often magical in nature and unexplained, with the sci-fi element being more a conduit for a different genre, like romance. In The Time Traveler's Wife, a man with chronodisplacement disorder tries to manage his relationship with his present-slash-future wife as he uncontrollably travels across the span of his own life, unable to affect any of the events. The time travel element allows the author to highlight the inevitable nature of time and the chronology of our life stories. Like other forms of speculative fiction, hero fiction interrogates real-world questions and problems via the fantastic. The curio is a vehicle for underscoring a particular concept and narrowing the story's scope. Then there's the body swap trope, also known as the Freaky Friday trope, where two characters switch bodies. They usually get trapped there with access to only their own thoughts and feelings, yet they have to pretend to be the other person. As TV Tropes puts it, the reason for this trope is usually to force the age-old moral. To better understand others, you must experience life in their shoes. In the 2003 movie version of Freaky Friday, a mother and daughter are constantly butting heads, so the body swap is how they finally learn to see through each other's eyes and have empathy. Not all curio fiction needs to deliver a moral. It's more about exploring an idea. Reincarnation as a narrative device, for example, is a way to examine the concept of identity. If you were born into a different body or different life circumstances, how would you be different as a person? What makes you, you, regardless of the context in which you exist? Kim Stanley Robinson combines alternate history with the curio of reincarnation in the epic novel The Years of Rice and Salt. The story imagines a world where instead of only a third of Europe's population dying during the Black Death, 99% perish instead. The reincarnation element allows the author to explore how the world would have changed across centuries. Alternate lives can feel like curio fiction when alternate timelines in the multiverse only focus on one person in particular. Life After Life by Kate Atkinson is a historical novel that shows different iterations of the main character's life. In one life, she drowns in childhood. In another, she dies of the Spanish flu or during the Blitz. She has partial memories of her previous lives that inform her future choices. It's a form of reincarnation, except the character isn't being reborn into a different body or era, but rather explores different paths within the same life. Another common curio trope is unusual aging or immortality. The curious case of Benjamin Button is a well-known example, and the film is loosely based on a short story by F. Scott Fitzgerald. In both versions, a man ages in reverse, experiencing all the emotional and physical challenges that come with living opposite of the norm. The story takes a what-if question, what if someone aged backward, and shows how it might play out. That type of thought experiment encourages the audience to re-examine familiar aspects of our existence that we might take for granted, like the strangeness of infancy and old age as part of our life cycle. Fiction can show us how to conceptualize the afterlife or death itself with a fantasy element. The Good Place could be considered curio fiction, since although it's set in the afterlife, it's innately tied to our real world. It's philosophical and metaphysical, turning abstract ideas into concrete settings, like the good place versus the bad place, or characters, such as personifications of death. The curio could involve a character who's gifted or cursed with telekinesis or clairvoyance. Whenever I think of telekinesis, the first story to come to mind is Matilda by Roald Dahl, where a sweet young girl can move things with her mind. Yet the story itself isn't about government experiments or her becoming a superhero. Instead, it's about how she pulls pranks on her mean parents and headmistress. She uses her powers to find a new sense of home. Telekinesis and clairvoyance often give characters a hidden strength, but also isolate them from normal society. 
They typically hide their powers from everyone except for a select few people they can trust. And their supernatural abilities tend to be a tool both for creating problems and solving them. Singular spells or curses are a pretty all-encompassing category. I like to call this the screw you in particular trope, where one person's life is turned upside down by something strange that happens to them for a short time period. There's a slew of movies from the late 1990s and early 2000s that follow this idea. Like Liar Liar, where a pathological liar finds he suddenly can't lie after his young son makes a birthday wish. Similar to time loops and body swaps, the curse is typically a way to make a character confront their own flaws by magically magnifying them. The horror novella Criterion by Tyler Jones features a cursed bike that forces the main character on a ride he can't escape, which serves as a metaphor for addiction. In a romance, the spell or curse typically serves as a way to bring two people closer together. In the young adult romance novel Instant Karma by Marissa Meyer, a girl gains the ability to cast instant karma to anyone around her, so she can dole out punishments to public vandals and mean gossips but her power backfires when it comes to one particular guy. Sci-fi stories can feel like curio fiction when the story is less interested in the technology and more interested in its effects on human relationships. In the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, a couple with a rough relationship both have their memories of each other erased. As the Wikipedia entry says, Kaufman, the writer, did not want to make the film a thriller and wanted to downplay the science fiction aspects of memory erasure focusing on the relationship. Just as with small-scale time travel, where the how is often left unexplained, certain near-future technology can have the feeling of being functionally the same as magic. As a quick side note, the one-notch-off fantastical element is even more common in Japanese storytelling. In the anime and manga Fruits Basket, members of a family are cursed to turn into animals of the Zodiac when they're hugged by the opposite sex. After falling into a cursed hot spring, the male protagonist of Rama One Half transforms into a woman when splashed with cold water, and back into a man when doused with hot water. The films of Makoto Shinkai feature a girl who can control the weather and weathering with you, and a body swap narrative with a twist in your name. All of these tropes put a touch of the fantastic in our ordinary world. Now I want to talk about why curio fiction deserves its own label. Let's go through a few of these common subgenres to help differentiate them. Magical realism as a genre label is typically used for works about post-colonialism, particularly those by Latin American authors. Keystones of the genre include 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie, and Beloved by Toni Morrison, all of which tackle the complicated aftermath of colonization. For this reason, some literary critics dissuade the use of magical realism as a label for general fiction that blurs the line between fantasy and reality. As I mentioned before, in magical realism, strange happenings are often treated as completely normal. In curio fiction, those same strange happenings are usually seen as surprising and unusual. Because readers don't have a more fitting term for this genre combination, they often categorize books like The Particular Sadness of Lemon Cake by Amy Bender as magical realism. The main character can taste the emotions of others from the foods they make. Since it doesn't explore a post-colonial cultural context, and magic is treated as surprising rather than unremarkable, this novel would not historically belong in the magical realism category. Fabulism relates more strongly to fables and myths, as the name implies, such as Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll and Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino. Fabulous stories often feel like the literary cousin to surrealist fiction, where the characters and prose tend to be as surreal and absurd as the world itself. But in other books that are sometimes labeled as fabulism, like Neil Gaiman's The Ocean at the End of the Lane, the characters and writing style remain grounded, staying consistent with the reader's own experience of the world. Curio stories are not so much an examination of a speculative landscape as they are a look into how these speculative elements affect the real world. Low fantasy is a fair descriptor for stories featuring speculative touches rather than fully immersive worlds where everything from the geography to the culture is impacted by the fantastical elements. However, this label has become a broad moniker. Sometimes full-on secondary world fantasy like A Song of Ice and Fire is listed as low fantasy because of the lessened emphasis on magic and non-human characters. That just further muddles the definition of low fantasy as a useful term for readers and critics. There's also a value judgment in the term low fantasy, 
although Wikipedia claims the word low refers to the prominence of traditional fantasy elements within the work and is not a remark on the work's overall quality. It still creates an implied hierarchy of low-high or soft-hard world-building, with high fantasy and hard sci-fi sometimes being viewed as more intellectually rigorous. Terms like soft science fiction, fantastical realism, and contemporary fantasy also lean more toward one genre classification over another, but I'm hankering for something more inclusive. With curio fiction, the speculative element functions the same way across genres, no matter if the primary driver of the element stems from fantasy, science fiction, or horror. For instance, the premise of They Both Die at the End by Adam Silvera includes a death cast service where people are told they're going to die on the day it will happen. It has that speculative element in near-future setting, but it's not a fully altered sci-fi world. It's our current world with one thing different. As with low fantasy, the value assumption inherent in the term light speculative fiction is why I'm not a fan of that phrasing. These stories aren't just light versions of larger genres, they merely have different levels of focus and thematic aims. Light speculative fiction also suggests a light-hearted tone, which isn't always the case, since curio fiction could overlap with horror and dark fantasy. The film The Brass Teapot, a dark comedy, is one such example. A couple finds a magical brass teapot that generates money when they inflict pain on themselves, and they test how far they can go with that violence. After going through all those subgenre labels, I know it sounds like I'm having a stop trying to make fetch happen, it's not going to happen moment, and trying to coin curio fiction. It might be unclear why this distinction matters at all. For me, the reason subgenres are important is twofold. They help audiences find these stories more easily, and they give people a way to examine this cohort of narratives using a shared vocabulary. Classification invites us to discuss the subgenre more intensely and thoroughly. And selfishly, I'm hopeful that popularizing a term like curio fiction will give me another way to describe the stories I love. Curio fiction also provides an easier entry point for readers who might not want to navigate an elaborate secondary world. Because the story is grounded in a familiar reality, that lowers the learning curve and mental barriers so the reader can directly compare the story's themes to their own lives and choices. Booksellers and librarians can use the curio fiction subgenre to tailor their recommendations, too. For authors, a label like curio fiction might help set expectations with their readers. Several books and movies I've included here have been criticized in reviews for not being magical enough or for not providing a scientific explanation for the story's unusual element. Much like noir communicates the idea of morally ambiguous characters to prospective readers, so could curio fiction inform them that this story is more concerned with the effect than the cause. When we group stories with similar qualities together, we can better explore what they aim to achieve in the larger narrative landscape. It's time for you to build your own curio fiction concept. If you'd like to follow along, grab a piece of paper or open a new Word document. We'll look at a few case studies and use them to build a new curio fiction concept, which will include these four elements. A story-defining speculative element, a curio. The limitations of the curio. A real-world setting. The specific relationship or social focus. Let's touch on these four items one by one. I'll have questions for you to think about at the end of each that will help you refine your story idea. First off is that story-defining speculative element, the curio. This is similar to having a high concept premise, which entails an idea that's easy to convey in a sentence. Take this description of the Midnight Library. Between life and death, there is a library, and within that library, the shelves go on forever. Every book provides a chance to try another life you could have lived, to see how things would be if you had made other choices. Because curio fiction is usually designed around a high concept premise, that can make it more appealing to readers and easier to market than other types of stories. It might help to start with a what-if question. What if a portal could put you in actor John Malkovich's head for 15 minutes at a time? Or what if a human fell in love with a humanoid amphibian? For your story idea, how would you phrase your curio as a what-if question? Personally, I can't get enough of love potions. So mine might be something like, what if a love potion went wrong and it made everyone but the intended recipient fall in love with the main character? What is the catalyst for the curio? Is it biological or did they piss off the wrong person or drink something or just wake up that way? Next is defining the limitations of your chosen curio. 
and Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi, people can travel back or forward in time when they're at that specific cafe. But there are very specific guidelines. You can only go back in time to meet someone who was in the cafe at the same time you were. You need to sit in one particular seat, and you can't get up from it. And you need to drink all the coffee in the cup before it gets cold, after which you're taken back to the present. Oh, and nothing you do in the past impacts the present. It's quite a lot of limitations, but the small-scale time travel is what makes it curio fiction. The story is about people learning about themselves through having honest conversations with important people in their lives. Limitations give the story its own internal logic, even if the speculative aspect doesn't have a clear explanation for why it exists, only how it's used. Pushing Daisies does this as well, where pie maker Ned can awaken the dead with a single touch. Yet if he touches them again, they're dead for good. And if he keeps the dead person alive for more than 60 seconds, someone else in the vicinity will die instead. There are consequences to the magic, which creates conflict and keeps things interesting. The curio can't solve the protagonist's problems, in fact it usually creates more problems and moral conundrums. A couple questions for you to consider when it comes to the limitations of your curio. Is there a particular time or place the character encounters the curio? Like with Before the Coffee Gets Cold, the time travel happens only at that particular coffee shop. Perhaps there are constraints on how often they can use it, or they're forced to use it. With time loops, it's usually every 24 hours, so when they go to sleep, the day starts over. They don't really have a choice in the matter. Are there any consequences if they try to avoid the curio, or if they use it in the wrong way? Maybe they're cursed to not leave their most hated enemy's side, and if they try, an invisible force pulls them back. With your curio and its limitations in hand, we can move on to the real world setting. By that, I simply mean a world that's grounded in our reality, rather than a full-on secondary fantasy and sci-fi environment. Our world, but one notch off. Groundhog Day takes place very specifically in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, for the annual Groundhog Festival. Choosing a lesser-known holiday made the story more memorable, and the idea of spring ties into the story's theme of renewal and redemption. Oftentimes, the setting and the curio work in tandem, or the curio springs from the setting. In the historical novel The Beautiful Ones by Silvia Moreno-Garcia, the curio is telekinesis and a few other powers in the high society world of the late 19th century, with debutantes and magic entertainers. Telekinesis serves to further ostracize the main characters from society in a story that's all about class hierarchies and not so much about the magic system. But imagine being a telekinetic in a different cultural context or time period. Being a telekinetic when your family is part of a New Age cult could create other problems and present different themes about belief and power. Curio fiction is all about exploring the sociology and psychology of our world, and the setting speaks to that. So what real-world setting in terms of place and time period makes sense for your curio? You can also think about scene-level settings like a school or a festival or a bakery. Going off of that, what social norms does the curio break? Where are these social norms strongest in society? If you have a teenage character who can make people's clothes disappear with the point of a finger, a church camp might be a particularly taboo setting for that. This might not apply to all story concepts, but it's a way to add a thematic layer and explore interesting sources of conflict. You might also consider what themes you would like to explore through this curio. If humanity's relationship with nature is a theme, the curio might involve a magical garden. We're on the final ingredient for your curio fiction concept, and that's the core relationship you're exploring in this story. Romance is a common relationship focus in curio fiction, like in The Sight of You by Holly Miller where a clairvoyant man knows that the woman he loves is going to die in the near future. It makes it difficult for him to be in a relationship with her because that knowledge is always looming over his head. The core relationship could involve family, friends, or co-workers as well, or society itself. One of my favorite novels is Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes, where a man of below-average intelligence named Charlie undergoes a procedure to increase his IQ. Through his journal entries, we see that Charlie's heightened IQ changes how people interact with him and his awareness of what that means. The novel embodies the idea that ignorance is bliss. So what type of relationship are you interested in exploring? A romantic one? Familial? Friendship? Something else? What flaw in your character or in human relationships does the curio heighten? 
It's like how Flowers for Algernon shows that those deemed lesser are ridiculed and taken advantage of, yet being too intelligent leads to isolation and loneliness. You can think of what conflicts arise in these relationships because of the curio, like in The Sight of You, where the protagonist's clairvoyance gets in the way of his romance. Now take these four elements and turn it into a single sentence. It doesn't have to be a beautiful sentence, it's just a way to condense your concept into a bite-sized pitch. I'll borrow from It's a Wonderful Life for my example. In upstate New York during the Great Depression, an angel helps a depressed businessman by showing him what life would have been like for his family in his hometown if he had never existed. Curio fiction might not be a thing yet, but you can help it catch on by using the hashtag CurioFiction on Twitter and elsewhere, or sharing this video with the other bookish people in your life. My dream is to see a table of books at a library or bookshop with a sign that says Curio Fiction. Thank you very much for indulging me in my latest storytelling adventures, and if you write Curio Fiction, know that you'll always have an audience in me. What are your favorite Curio Fiction stories? Help me coin my new subgenre by hyping it up in the comments. Whatever you do, keep writing. Thank you.